Hello, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us right, right here in the studios of ABS Television, ABS Radio, and our online platforms for another ABS Massive presentation. It is a world premiere. The interview we have with Prime Minister and Finance Minister, Honorable Gaston Brown. Prime Minister Brown speaks with us about matters of the economy, social services, governance, the existential threat posed by climate change, and so many hot-button issues, including, of course, the lead-up to the next general elections, constitutionally due in March 2023. We speak with the Prime Minister in an extensive interview right here on ABS on matters of absolute cerebral prominence and importance to the public of this country and beyond. We're also talking about regional issues as well. So this is the context in which we speak with Prime Minister Brown. The economy is recovering from, of course, the ravages of COVID-19. The pandemic itself is receding in terms of its public health threat. But at the same time, dark clouds globally are starting to gather. Kristalina Gorgieva, the IMF Managing Director, spoke about the fact that the risk of a recession is rising. However, the agencies, including ECLAC and the IMF, are bullish on the prospects of Antigua and Barbuda's economy. ECLAC projects 7.5% growth for this country in 2022. The IMF projects 6%. It is normally more conservative. So how are we looking on the economic front? And on the social front, on social services, what about roads and health and education? We speak with the Prime Minister about all these issues. It's a fair and balanced discussion, no holes barred. We look forward to your comments and your questions a bit later on in this two-hour special. Prime Minister, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. It's certainly a pleasure. Indeed. And a special good evening to my countrymen and countrywomen. Indeed. So let's start off with a look at the economy, Prime Minister. How optimistic are you? about the levels of growth that both the IMF and ECLAC are projecting for this country, you think that the recovery is going as well as you would have wanted? Absolutely. In fact, I am an eternal optimist. And even if the IMF and ECLAC had said otherwise, I'm pretty sure that uh, based on the investments that we've attracted and um, even the domestic investments that are taking place, both within the public and private sectors, that we would have um, predicted a strong recovery. As you know, in 2021, uh, we recovered 7.4%. The economy grew by 7.4%. And this year, we expected to do at least 7.5%. So it means that we would have recovered about 15% of the 20% loss in 2020. And uh, no one can argue that um, we have not made a strong recovery. And when you juxtapose that to what happened um, during the global crisis, which was a far, lesser, a far less impactful crisis, you recognize that the then administration struggled and they experienced decline or contraction after contraction every year, year after year. So I think that um, we have shown a degree of resilience uh, never before seen because, as you know, the COVID pandemic has been the uh, most um, impactful uh, challenge that any country, any government would have experienced within the last 100 years. Uh, so I'm very pleased with the recovery. And I would say that by the end of um, 2023, we should um, exceed the uh, value of the economy as at the end of 2019. So whereas the IMF um, is suggesting that the recovery will be completed in 2025, I am of the view that by the fourth quarter of um, 2023, that we would have surpassed the level of growth and the size of the economy as at the end of December 31st, 2019. We hear from the IMF 6% growth forecast for this year. Uh, ECLAC is projecting 7.5%. Uh, by the way, ECLAC's projections, Prime Minister, in, would indicate that the country would be the fifth fastest growing economy in Latin America and the Caribbean, if that is realized. Correct. Are you uh, in line with those pros prospects, or are you thinking more? Well, I just give you um, our predictions in that we expect to grow the country's economy by at least 7.5% this year, notwithstanding the increase in inflation. And as I said last year, we grew the country's economy by 7.4%. So you're looking at a recovery of approximately 15% of the 20% that we lost in 2020. And clearly, it's a strong recovery. And in terms of the medium-term growth, I have no doubt that we'll be in a position to sustain rates of growth in the region of 7 to 8%. Now, prior to COVID, uh, the country enjoyed average annual growth of about 5%. Post-COVID, the annual average growth is likely to rise to about 7%. So you can see again that you have a highly performing administration that continues to preside over the expansion of the country's economy. 
uh, lifting people out of poverty and at the same time providing lots of opportunities for entrepreneurship, opportunities for home ownership, opportunities uh, for car ownership, business ownership, literally um, empowering our people to control the commanding heights of the country's economy and at the same time making Antiguans and Barbudans wealthier and obviously to restore the losses of 2020 and to go beyond those losses and to position Antigua and Barbuda to become an economic powerhouse in the Caribbean. I mean, I know there are many who would laugh after that vision, but you know, when we were in opposition in 2013, uh, we were sufficiently focused that even before assuming the governance of the country, we established a vision for Antigua and Barbuda to transform the country into an economic powerhouse. And that is because as an institution, we have a large ambition and we do not believe that despite our size, our challenges in terms of the small size of the country's population, the limited uh, human and financial resources, that um, we should confine our prospects to mediocrity. We believe that our ambition should be large and we are also confident in our capacity and certainly the capacity of the people to achieve that economic powerhouse which we have set as a vision for Antigua and Barbuda. And I want to make the point here too. No vision was established in this country after independence. And the fact that my administration took the initiative to establish a vision, I do not believe that that vision to establish or to transform Antigua and Barbuda into an economic powerhouse should be a politically contentious issue. I believe that where our political opponents should be competing is that they should be able to demonstrate to the people of Antigua and Barbuda that they have greater capacity to achieve that vision. But I believe that the vision should have the buy-in of all Antiguans and Barbudans, notwithstanding their, uh, let's say, um, political persuasion, and not to make the vision the subject of um, you know, partisan politics, but at the same time to understand that um, the vision has been firmly established. And what is important is for administrations that will follow, that it will build on the gains that we would have achieved and to continue to focus on the achievement of that vision. Uh, Prime Minister, so you're pretty bullish on the prospects for the, economy, mm -hmm. for the for economic growth. This is what Chris Pellini brought here about the IMF Managing Director said recently. And you flagged that the risks of recession are rising. We estimate that countries accounting mm -hmm. for about one third of the world economy will experience at least two consecutive quarters of contraction this or next year. That, of course, is the technical definition for recession. And even when growth is positive, it will feel like a recession because of shrinking the real incomes and rising prices. So it's a pretty sobering prospect in terms of for the medium, for the short to medium term. What do you think this will impact on your own vision for growth in this country? Well, it is. We have seen and endured increases in prices um, to include fuel prices, um, food prices. But at the same time, the country's economy continues to grow. So we have not fallen into a recession. And based on the current rate of growth, it is unlikely that we will see a recession. Uh, we expect um, growth to continue uh, into 2023 and beyond. Uh, so unlike certain countries that are now experiencing a recession as a result of the increase in um, prices globally, and through no fault of their own, because we all know that um, the increase in um, inflation is driven primarily uh, by the war on Ukraine. And um, you know, that's an exogenous um, factor that is really, um, let's say, uh, serving as a drag on growth. But here in Antigua and Barbuda, we have been sufficiently resilient in that um, we continue to grow the country's economy. And at this point, there is no prospect of any recession. Okay. I promise, let's talk about debt. Uh, how is the debt? trajectory going, debt to GDP especially, obviously it would have been impacted by the growth in uh, GDP. So real gross domestic product uh, would of course impacted on the, there's a numerator in the, the denominator. Growth is a positive, but what about debt to GDP generally is a ratio? Right, so as a result of the contraction in the economy in 2020, uh, we lost 20%, so it would have meant that the denominator would have fallen, and that in itself would have resulted in an automatic increase in the debt to GDP, not because of any significant borrowings by our administration. Uh, so debt to GDP actually increased about 102% in 2020, as of the end of 2020. We have since gotten it down to just about 90%, and it will continue to fall. Uh, in fact, I will project that um, by the end of um, 2023, we should be down to about 80%. So we're also making um, significant strides in reducing the debt to GDP. 
And again, it shows the resilience, it shows the competence of our administration that notwithstanding the fact that we have had to borrow in order to um, deal with the additional expenses um, that uh, were as a result of um, COVID, that we've been able to literally, um, uh, let's say, reduce the debt to GDP down to 90% within an 18-month period. So again, it's remarkable performance, and um, I'm very proud of my team, and certainly the public servants and all Antiguans and Barbados in general, because there's some people who believe that um, growth is exclusively as a result of the administration. I will accept that it is my administration that is providing the leadership, but at the end of the day, you have individuals at the micro-organizational level within the private sector who are contributing. You have public servants who are contributing to this growth. So again, you know, when our political opponents um, decide to um, speak um, ill about the growth that we have um, experienced, they're literally um, attacking the contributions of the public servants and those in the private sector who are adding to the productive capacity of our country and literally fueling growth and development. Will this 90% prominence that you're talking about in terms of the debt to GDP ratio, would that be aggregate debt, including, for example, debt guarantees, all debt for the public all sector? Debts. All debts, mm -hmm. including debts that are guaranteed um, by the central government uh, covering statutory organizations. So this is inclusive of all debts. Mm. At $50 million U.S. Prime Minister was available to the country from the CDB. You took half of that, run about to two years ago, Correct. Uh, 25 million U.S. Are you looking to get drawdown on the other 25 million? Yes, and uh, that should become um, available probably within the next 30 to 60 days. Uh, the CDB should have held a board meeting about um, a month ago. Unfortunately, that board meeting did not take place. So we expect that um, sometime next month or probably next month they will have this board meeting and the additional 25 million US dollars will be made available. And obviously we have earmarked um, those funds um, for certain spending including giving public servants an increase. Let's talk about that, Prime Minister, an increase of public servants. It is perhaps the question that has dominated the pre-interview discussion, Prime Minister. Uh, many people wanted us to ask about this. Mm -hmm. What is expected to be the quantum of that, or at least the range of it? Well, I mean, I would not want to preempt the negotiating committee. Uh, a negotiating committee was established in 2018 and you would have recalled that we gave a 5% and uh, now negotiating the final amount. I believe that um, initially uh, there was a proposal for 7%. It was rejected by the various bargaining agents and uh, we have asked our negotiating team to increase the amount. Uh, so I'm hoping that within the upcoming weeks that they will come to some agreement and that we'll have a formal proposal before the cabinet, which we stand ready to accept. Mm. And this would be retroactive to any period? Probably? Yes, it will be retroactive and we certainly put the arrangements in place to also pay the back pay. Interesting. You're expecting this to be completed again? Hold, hold Before so. December 31st, 2022. So there'll be an increase of public sector workers plus back, back pay? Absolutely. Interesting, Prime Minister. This will come from the 25 million, the additional 25 well, million? Well, you know, the, we, we're pursuing different sources of funding. Uh, in this year's um, budget, the 2022 budget, we had actually budgeted for an increase of public servants. The issue now is, is funding it. Now we'd recognize that we have not recovered um, the full revenue. I mean, we are still about maybe 10% um, below 2019 levels. Uh, so we have to borrow to fund um, these um, expenses. We are looking at different sources. Um, we, as you know, would have floated a bond early in the year, a 200 million US dollar bond. Unfortunately, the subscriber, the initial subscriber, did not offer a good deal. So it was just last week that we were able to get them to transfer the bond to another entity. And I believe that um, next week they should sign off on this bond. And on the basis that all goes well, uh, funds should start to flow from that bond um, probably within the next 14 days. Uh, so on the basis that that comes through, then clearly we'll have the type of um, funding in order to pay the back pay and to cover our expenses. We know, for example, that um, our um, creditors, um, those who pro provide services to the government and goods, many of them um, have arrears, and we want to make sure that we make some substantial payments. We may even factor their debt. So, for example, for some, we may even offer them maybe, uh, uh, well, suggest that they take a haircut and then pay off the balance, whatever it is. So we want to make a significant dent in the outstanding payables 
uh, so that um, we can have more monies in the economy and even to fuel uh, more robust growth within the country. So in as much as we are suggesting that we will do about, um, say, 7.5% next year, uh, when you look at the plethora of projects that are coming in stream and the fact too that the public sector itself uh, will be poised to spend even more monies within the domestic economy, then it means that um, we should be in a position to even exceed at 7.5%. Uh, so again, you know, we know that um, as a result of COVID that um, the arrears would have um, built up. We know that there's some frustration within the society. And I certainly want to take this opportunity to thank our creditors um, who would have shown some forbearance. And I think we are now, um, you know, at the, uh, there's a silver lining now and we should be getting the necessary funds in order to bring some relief to those individuals. So again, you know, we, we are not politicians. Uh, who have our feet um, firmly planted in the skies. We know what is happening, we understand the frustrations, and we certainly will want to remove those irritants and to bring some relief and to go into 2023 positively and certainly to um, enjoy robust growth and development and at the same time to continue to focus on the socio-economic empowerment of the people of Antigua and Barbuda. So, Prime Minister, are you looking at within the, uh, the next few weeks, $25 million U.S. more from CDB? Precisely plus 200 million US dollars from this bond. And the net proceeds would be about 160 million because um, the interest is paid up front. And um, there are certain fees, organizational fees, negotiating fees, negotiating fees and so on. So yes, um, potentially be 160 million. Obviously, all of it will not be paid in one tranche. I mean, could be over a period of maybe 60 days um, in which we'll have the payments until the full 160 million US dollars um, is completely drawn down. So let's talk about the uh, interest rate prominence. So the coupon rate on this $200 million uh, bond, how is it? How competitive is it? Well, certainly um, far more competitive than the previous one. Um, when we looked at the overall yield to the investor uh, for the initial subscriber, it would have been over 10%. And we thought that that was usurious, and that is why that bond failed. So we had said earlier that the bond was oversubscribed because we had another subscriber. Uh, that has uh, shown an interest to subscribe for the full amount of the bond. Uh, they have given us a better deal. Uh, at one point, the yield would have been probably in the region of about, um, I'd say, five and a half, six percent. Unfortunately, there has been an uptick in interest rates um, globally, so I think we're closer to seven, uh, which is still acceptable compared to, you know, over 10 percent. You know, you're borrowing $200 million and, um, you know, you're paying an extra three, four percent. An extra 4%, um, that's about 8 million US dollars a year in interest. That can literally build a school. So we are very cautious, very prudent in the way in which we handle public resources. And we always ensure that we get the best value for money for the people of Antigua and Barbuda. That's a standard operating procedure, uh, standard philosophy of my government. Okay, so uh, the coupon rate will be around 7% you're expecting? The net amount, um, mm -hmm. or if you want to say the gross amount for that matter, because the net amount on the bond is about 4.5%. But the gross amount um, would be in the region of about 7%. Okay, all right. W when you get the additional $200 million from the bond, plus the $25 million additional from CDB, how will this impact on the debt-to-GDP ratio again? Or, or has that been baked in? It, 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 will, it will increase the debt-to-GDP, but again, based on the robust growth that we expect, by next year it will fall. Uh, and again, you have to understand that these funds will be spent in very productive ways in order to boost the country's economy. As I said before, a portion of it will be utilized to pay domestic debts and to, and I'm sure too, by paying those debts, um, the beneficiaries, they will spend more and that too will help to uh, fuel additional growth. Uh, we certainly want to use those funds to build greater capacity in um, education, healthcare, housing, Housing will be one of the major uh, beneficiaries um, as we seek to scale up um, the amount of homes that we are building on an annual basis. Uh, even our um, urban renewal um, program in order to renew the old housing stock and to provide funding for the repairs of homes, we'll have funding that will make available for that purpose. Uh, we recognize that we still have a lot of dilapidated uh, wooden properties on the landscape of Antigua and Barbuda. And we certainly will be making a determined effort to replace those. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we have resilient and sustainable housing. And the government will be intervening to make funding available to homeowners to repair their homes. We would have already announced the initiative in which um, we will give loans up to $25,000 over 10 years. And part of the funding uh, from this bond 
will be utilized um, for that purpose. And in addition, we'll make uh, more monies available to national housing so that they can further scale up the housing project. Okay, so housing will be a major focus on Major. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd recognize that um, our government um, would have concentrated on, on housing, education, and healthcare. Uh, we believe that those are three critical sectors to empower the people of Antigua and Barbuda. You know that um, we would have given over the last um, eight years on average about $30 million um, in gifts and grants to students. And this is all part of um, ensuring that we build the intellectual capacity of um, our people to make sure that they are sufficiently qualified and well trained so that they can compete with the best in the world. Uh, we have also um, spent a significant amount of um, resources, as you know, at UWE. Even before we were able to um, open the doors at UWE or to get approval, we had to pay off a um, raise totaling um, $20 million. And then we had to agree to spend at least $15 million a year in order to fund UWE Five Islands. So during the last two and a half years, we would have spent about um, $50 million or more uh, getting UWE operational. And that does not include the $30 million that we give for scholarships um, annually. And remember, too, that we also have students going to UWE um, in the various campuses in um, Barbados, Trinidad, and Jamaica. And they, too, uh, they, get, they, they get funding from the government of Antigua and Barbuda. In fact, we have now, on an annual basis, about 2% of our population, over 2,000 people, who are on scholarship and getting support from the government. And it is one of the ways to empower youth and to take the strain off of um, families who, other than having this type of support, would have had to incur significant debts or student loans, student loans that would have burdened um, these individuals. So again, that is a form of empowerment that many people perhaps have not identified with. And we are determined in you know, investing in our people, and that is why we have spent hundreds of millions of dollars. In fact, $240 million given grants, and in terms of um, housing, we have spent over $300 million. We have uh, provided over 1,000 uh, climate resilient homes, uh, concrete homes with um, good infrastructure. And the whole idea is to lift the, or to improve the living standard of our people and to help those in the low class to transition into the middle class to provide good housing and to improve the quality of life of our people. Even in terms of car ownership, uh, you would probably know that um, uh, you know, we would have had up to about four or 5,000 units per year imported into this country. And invariably, we would have given them um, duty freeze on these vehicles that have been imported over the years. Even during this period in which revenues are down, we still continue to give them um, duty freeze. And the whole idea, again, is to make car ownership more affordable. And what it does there, too, it makes our people more resilient. What we found, for example, during the period of COVID is that um, many individuals um, who, and all of us were affected by COVID, but uh, the working class people generally who ordinarily would have had maybe a loan of sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 in a motor vehicle, you found that um, they actually owned their used vehicle that they paid cash for it. So they didn't run the risk of running into rears with the domestic banks. And as a consequence, that would have added to their resilience. Now, if we didn't give the duty freeze, then clearly car ownership would have been beyond the means of certain individuals. So you can see that um, you know, we are caring, we're an inclusive government, and our policies are people friendly to make sure that we empower the people of Antigua and Barbuda through um, business ownership, home ownership, car ownership, through scholarships, and even business ownership. You know, we have the Prime Minister's Entrepreneurial Development Fund. We're going to come back to that, Prime Minister, the Prime Minister's sure. Entrepreneurial Development Fund. We're going to take a short break here on this uh, a powerful ABA special. It's an interview with Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, Honorable Gaston Brown. We're talking about the economy. We've been talking about it since the start of this program. If you're just joining us, you would have missed breaking news. The Prime Minister assuring the nation that there will be an increase in salaries for public sector workers plus back pay on the 31st of December this year. Plus, he says there will be some relief for long-suffering creditors to the government. They'll be getting some funds as well. Still to come, Jolly Beach Resort, that, of course, purchased by the, by the government. Plus, significant developments on the horizon for, hotel, for, for more hotels and so on. Social services, governance issues, all that ahead on this powerful special edition of our ABS special. Stay with us. Let's get social. We're ready to connect with you. Find us on Facebook. Do you tweet? We do. Send us a tweet. Connect with us on Instagram. Keep up to date with news and more at www.abstvradio.com.
has launched new fiber areas. Potters, Herberts, Gunthrops, Olivers, Buckley Line, Renfew, Seaview Farm, Lightfoot, La Pasture, Ferris Farm, Freeman's Village, Clarks Hill, Bellevue Estate, Jonas Road, Mac Pond, Osborne, Mount Joy, Cedar Hill, Parham, Vernons, Pierce, Setons, Glanvilles, Willokies. It's your time to upgrade to fiber. Visit inetfiber.apua.ag to upgrade or sign up online. Did you miss your area announcement? Inet Fiber is already in the north and northwest parts of Antigua. Check our map for locations. Visit inetfiber.apua.ag to upgrade to fiber today. If you are under a hurricane watch or warning, you should take important steps to prepare for the storm. Ensure your family has an emergency plan. Know the location of the nearest hurricane shelter. Stock your home and vehicle with emergency supplies. Secure or protect potential home hazards such as utilities. Stay tuned to your radio and or television and listen to local authorities. This message is brought to you by the Antigua Barbuda Broadcasting Services. For more information on hurricane preparedness, contact the National Office of Disaster Services at 462-4206. A warm welcome back. Thank you so much for staying with us for this ABS special. It's our interview with Prime Minister and Finance Minister Honorable Gaston Brown, a two-hour special where we update the nation based on uh, our questions to the Prime Minister on matters of the economy, all hot-button issues, social services, governance issues. Plus, of course, it's an election season because the election uh, is constitutionally due by March next year. So far, the Prime Minister has announced that there will be an increase in salaries to public sector workers before the end of this year, plus back pay. It says that the government is set to draw down on $25 million more from the CDB. The CDB had $50 million U.S. available to the uh, government. The government took $25 million about uh, 18 months ago, and another $25 million will be made available. $200 million U.S. dollars will be made available from a bond that has been placed by the government as well. Prime Minister, thank you so much for staying with us. So let's move on to this issue of uh, the creditors. Will they also get some money before the end of this year? Because the, the creditors still gone. Absolutely. Uh, that's the objective. Um, as soon as the bond proceeds um, start to flow, we'll commence payments. And I would say periodically we'll make um, lump sum pay payments. In some instances, as I said, we will, um, with the agreement of the creditor, um, factor the debt and may be able to make full payment. Okay. Just coming back to the issue of the public sector workers and the salary increase that they're going to be getting. So the unions are still negotiating with the government. Are you confident that that will happen mm -hmm. before the end of this year? Well, yeah, I know sometimes that, you know, unions deliberately filibuster. I don't know why, but um, I would want to appeal to them to try and come to some agreement, uh, certainly before the end of the year. And one of the reasons um, we'd want to have this matter settled before the end of the year, we have to be cognizant of the fact that there has been an increase in prices, and we'd want to bring some relief to public servants as soon as possible. So I just hope that um, there'll be some common ground as soon as possible so that we can make um, that payment. And then we'll also have to, perhaps early next year, enter into the negotiations of a new contract, and that we from the, from the year 2021 for another three-year period. What are the unions, as you said, sometimes you said that they have a push off for doing that. What if they stall and think that perhaps the government has a timeline working with, government wants to get this out of the way by the end of this year. What if they essentially try to uh, get a little bit more out of the government than what you would have wanted? Well, I don't want to necessarily speculate that they would stall or to make any unreasonable demands. I would imagine that um, they would recognize that, look, their membership they need an increase, and whereas they have an obligation to get the best possible um, increase for their membership, uh, they also have to take into consideration the financial circumstances of the government and the fact that um, you know, if they make any unreasonable demand, then they will just be protracting the issue. And I don't see there's any value in that type of behavior. You mentioned the rising prices, Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. Inflationary pressure is being felt all over the world uh, because, of course, uh, one, there was the, the there was supply chain issues brought on by COVID. Then, of course, there was mm -hmm. the uh, war in Ukraine, which exacerbated those. Are you still looking to raise the minimum wage? Because that has been a absolutely an discussion. Absolutely. Uh, that is another negotiation that is taking place. Uh, that is a committee that is um, about to conclude its work and to make a recommendation to the cabinet. Uh, so we are waiting for the committee to complete its work. Uh, clearly they have to uh, involve all stakeholders. Uh, so this is not for the committee to just decide on their own what the minimum wage should be. 
So we've asked them to accelerate the consultative process and to come to a final determination so that we can also make that decision certainly before the end of the year. Before the end of this year? Absolutely. There's some who are looking on Prime Minister and saying, wow, you, you seem to be on a, you're kind of turbocharging some of these things to, you know, to get them done by the end of this year. Uh, they, they're thinking perhaps there's a political undertone to it. How would you respond to that? Well, we're responding to the global crisis and uh, we recognize that um, you know, it has protracted and the issue of urgent intervention uh, that becomes um, you know, even more important at this point. Uh, so it's primarily about bringing relief to the people of Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, if a chance, opportunity arises to call elections then, well, I will give serious consideration to it. Let's talk about the elections, Prime Minister. <laughs> Constitution to do by March 2023. Since you raised it, uh, good segue. Any hint that you want to give us? Well, what I'll say is that um, the elections are due by March 23rd of next year, and we do have an extra 90 days to call elections. <laughs> Certainly, you wouldn't want to be extending so far as beyond the uh, you, you, never can, you never can tell. We have plenty of money to spend. We may need time to spend the money. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I'm pretty sure that uh, the, the public is ruminating on your comments there, Prime Minister. <laughs> So, uh, and by the way, let me make it abundantly clear that um, in the event uh, I was to take that decision, uh, this does not represent any form of fear. Okay. Okay? In no fact, fear. I can tell you that um, up to the, this point that um, the Labour Party's governance of the country is not threatened. And we would have had um, polls that would have uh, at least indicate that um, so far the government is still solid and where we may have one or two seats that have some weaknesses, I believe that within the last several months that we would have um, certainly strengthened those seats and we're now positioning the anti and Bible Labour Party to take all 17 seats. That all is 17. all 17. And I say so with a straight face and I believe it's doable. Uh, you see, when you have a weak opposition party with um, individuals who bring no real value and individuals who are destructive in their outlook, destructive in their behaviour, we have to go all out to save the country from those type of reckless um, people and to ensure that the country can continue to advance on the, the anti Kimbab Labour Party to take the country to the next level. Now, you also have to understand, too, that this is a very challenging period to govern. This is not a time to experiment with neophytes. It's not a time to engage charlatans, losers and laggards. This is a time for the people of Antigua and Barbuda to continue to stand with the anti Kimbab Labour Party that would have delivered, we have performed, in fact, I think that my administration has been a dynamic in, uh, institution, administration, uh, certainly one of the most dynamic, if not the most dynamic uh, administration that this country has seen since independence. We have outperformed every single administration since independence in all sectors of the country's economy. You name it, housing, education, health care, even in agriculture. So we, we stand proudly in our performance. Uh, infrastructure, again, that's an area of um, great success of my administration. You would have known that we spent $540 million to um, uh, want to rebuild two, uh, 100 million US or 270 million uh, EC dollars to rebuild the cargo port, a similar amount to redevelop um, the cruise port and to expand it so that we can accommodate the Oasis class ships. So, or Oasis class ships. So, you know, we have done an excellent job, and I feel confident to say so without any fear of any contradiction. Our political opponents, who obviously are jaundiced eyed, will obviously say otherwise, but the evidence is there for all to see. And we have been systematically circulating the uh, videos and certainly the um, photographs of um, the various projects that we have uh, presided over. And no one can say that my administration has not performed, and I feel proud that I can stand in any fora and defend the contribution of my, my administration towards the empowerment of the people of Antigua and Barbuda. You're clearly pleased, Prime Minister, about the performance on the economy. Would you countenance a debate with your political opponents leading up to the election, especially on matters of finance and the economy? Well, I will never um, refuse the opportunity to debate um, my political opponent, whomever that may be. I would imagine that as a leader, of the Antigua and Barbuda Party and Prime Minister, that the person who has a locus is the leader of the opposition. Uh, that will be a total mismatch. 
Uh, now, on the other hand, if they wanted to send Harold Lovell, I mean, he's just as weak. The only problem with that is that do I debate the leaders of political parties? Because in that case, I'll have to debate um, DNA and um, all the other French parties because they're leaders too. Uh, but in any case, I think that the people of Antigua and Barbuda, they are fully aware of um, my government's um, policies. They are fully aware of um, our successes. In fact, I have been on a radio program practically every Saturday, barring when I was out of, uh, I was out of state. And um, there's hardly anything to debate in the sense that we have been easily one of the most um, open um, administrations um, that this country has seen. We have had um, our... Um, press conferences after every cabinet for over eight years now. It's the only administration that has been so open. And one of the reasons to why I engage in this um, program on a Saturday in Point FM you know, is to deal with current issues and to be accountable, even in terms of my own personal conduct, and to you know, keep the people informed as to what is happening within the government. So I don't know there's really anything to debate per se, but I will never refuse the opportunity to debate anyone in this country. Okay, all right. I promise, so just going back quickly to the matter of the debt-to-GDP ratio, an additional loan that the government has, uh, in, in fact, is working on getting now, is a $75 million loan from a friendly government, uh, you're calling it, uh, and this is for the University of the Western is Five Islands campus to expand the campus. Will this not add to the debt-to-GDP ratio? Right, so we expect um, that loan to be serviced by the university itself, um, based on the service that it will be providing. Uh, in fact, the plan is to... Uh, draw down about $40 million in the first instance um, to build out um, certain critical facilities, um, some lecture theaters, um, uh, some dorms, and some other amenities uh, so that um, the revenues generated from those facilities will be sufficient to service a loan. So it should not create any strain on the government's debt service ratio. Uh, I would accept, though, that it could result in a, an increase in the debt to GDP. But again, the funding that will be spent um, from that, uh, what, 40 million US, 108 million EC dollars, will help to also increase uh, economic growth. And when I said earlier that we could get up to about 10%, uh, yet it's also based on the spending of the central government. And let us not forget, too, that we have PLH in Barbuda. They're literally spending about 200 million US dollars a year now in the country's economy. And uh, there are many other projects. Uh, there are several. Um, that are about to start. In fact, one of the problems that we have now is that um, we have a shortage of skilled labor. And uh, we may have to allow some um, skilled labor to be imported in order to satisfy the labor demand. And it's a good problem to have. And um, again, as I said, I don't think there's any other country in the Caribbean that has, uh, let's say, um, more investments per capita than Antigua and Barbuda at this point. Mm -hmm. So again, it yes. shows uh, another area of success. You know. During the global crisis, the then finance minister, Mr. Harry Lovell, said that it was impossible to attract investments and that no investments were taking place uh, within the region. And he himself admitted that during his tenure as finance minister that he could not attract investments. It's interesting that um, a decade later, uh, with the worst crisis that um, any country has seen um, during the last 100 years, that my administration has been able to attract hundreds of millions of dollars in investments. So it shows the capacity of my administration and the type of resilience that we have built into the country's economy to the extent that we can continue to project growth, positive growth, and would have a recovery within a three-year period. Let us not forget that after the global crisis, uh, the then administration was unable to recover the country's economy. So they lost 25% net, and it was only after we took over the governance of the country in 2014 that we were able to stabilize the country's economy and then to, uh, let's say, uh, introduce what I consider to be um, stable, sustainable growth of about 5%. Uh, so having done that, now that we're faced with a far more impactful crisis, uh, we would have shown the competence again to recover quickly and to recover within a three-year period, which I think is remarkable. And at the same time, I think that um, based on the socioeconomic infrastructure that we have put in place, that Antigua and Barbuda within the next decade will be a significantly different place. I guarantee you that within the next decade, we will probably have about um, seven of each 10 adults in this country having a tertiary degree. 
uh, or if not a tertiary degree, some form of um, vocational certification that is acceptable internationally. Is it 7 out of 10, you said? 7 out of 10, of absolutely. 70% okay. okay. of the adult population. Okay. Okay. And we, we have the infrastructure in place. Even um, uh, individuals who may have not completed their um, secondary education or may have dropped out of school or they left school without any subject or only a few subjects, they now have the opportunity to enroll in the Second Chance program and to matriculate for UE5 Island. So we have a full infrastructure. In fact, our educational policy is one of um, cradle to grave. So when you look at the fact, too, that we are building out these um, early childhood facilities, uh, there's one in um, Buckley's that can accommodate about 250 students, and we'll be building out four others starting um, before the end of the year. Uh, we're providing that opportunity for early childhood education within the various communities, especially the poor communities. And at the same time, they will have, continue to have or enjoy uh, free primary, free secondary um, education. Uh, they will have the opportunity to go to the new ABIS, uh, the Antique and Barbuda Institute of Continuing Education. Uh, we'll be spending about $20 million to redevelop that facility and to provide um, vocational training um, uh, uh, education, skills education um, that will be internationally certified, or they can go to five islands. So you can see that you know, we have a full educational infrastructure in place that will result in, let's say, better citizens. In fact, even when you look at the healthcare, improvements in healthcare, and I do accept that we have some gaps that we need to resolve, and I know the Minister of um, Health and certainly his um, technicians, they're looking at sort of some of those issues in terms of the service quality and so on. But when you look at the amount of um, experts that we have at uh, Mount St. John in different disciplines, the fact too that we are now um, constructing the renal center, we are the foundation now, they're now building the superstructure, and we will have very shortly uh, a cardiac unit uh, by next year at Mount St. John. We will also provide um, the opportunity for each Antigua and Barbuda to enjoy full health care, while at the same time realizing their full actualization dreams in terms of being fully educated. I mean, having um, better quality citizens, um, citizens who are globally competitive in terms of their uh, intellectual standing, and at the same time increasing national productivity, because in order to achieve an economic powerhouse, we must become more productive and that productivity will come through education and training. So you can see that we have already invested in the infrastructure to facilitate that increase in productivity, uh, to uh, increase growth and at the same time to increase um, income. Uh, because clearly, in order to sustain um, future increases, we also have to increase productivity. But in order to increase productivity, you have to increase training and education so that people become more competent. And I'm just very pleased about the things that we have done and the prospects of Antiguans and Barbudans to the extent that we are now positioning Antiguan and Barbudans to take it to the next level. So by the time we, let's say, um, roll out our manifesto, we won't be talking about Monday and things about giving your university. We've been there, done that. Or to give you a cardiac unit or renal unit, been there, done that. Or to increase um, housing, been there, done that. So we will be focusing now on some new technologies, um, certainly um, focusing on digitalization, the green economy, blue economy, uh, stem cells, blockchain um, tech talk technology, as well as even the cannabis industry, uh, new areas in which we are diversifying the country's economy and to take Antigua and Barbie to the next level. So some very, very exciting initiatives to come. We're going to talk about the economic, economic diversification as well, Prime Minister. Just going back quickly to the matters of GDP growth. So this year, almost to the end of the fiscal year, uh, you're saying you're expecting 7.5%? Absolutely. By next, next, next year, what are you expecting in terms of growth? Well, I've said, well? I would say conservatively, 75 But again, with the additional spending, it could get up to about 10% or more. Next year? Absolutely. Okay, so 7.5% this year, possibly up to 10% next year. Correct. There are those, though, Prime Minister, who say, look, that's all well and good to have that level of real gross domestic product growth. And by the way, inflation, would you say inflation is eaten into some of it? Because real GDP well, growth is really uh, correct. In, you know, growth uh, adjusted for inflation. But you know, in terms of the projections, um, we expect inflation to continue to fall. We expect um, prices to continue to fall um, in this fourth quarter going into first quarter of next year. Uh, so there should be some normalization, hopefully, by the end of the first quarter of um, 23. 
uh, in terms of prices. So uh, we do not expect that prices uh, will remain at artificially high, even though it is a volatile situation. I mean, all you need now, if um, Putin decides to drop a nuclear um, bomb on, um, on Ukraine, then that could change the equation. Okay. But assuming there is no such um, escalation, then we expect prices to continue to fall. Okay. The, 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 right. Uh, it was important to just raise that point, Prime Minister. But there are those who say it's all well and good to have that level of uh, growth in the economy, but mm -hmm. it doesn't filter down to the man on the ground sometimes. Mm -hmm. What would you say in terms, because the Gini coefficient is a little bit skewed here in Antigua Barbuda, uh, that there is not, the inequality is a challenge, income inequality especially. What are you going to do to fix that? Well, or at least to yeah, you know, we, we, we have a plethora of programs in order to ensure more equitable distribution of wealth. I mean, our housing initiative, for example, in which we literally underwrite up to 100, 150 million, uh, sorry, $50,000 per home right. is one of the ways in which we are literally um, empowering people and um, allowing for, uh, l let's say, um, a chance of wealth to the poor class of people. Uh, when you give duty frees, um, for example, to the poor class of people, that also is a transfer of wealth. And you would recognize now that the Gini coefficient is not as high as it was back in 2014. So these are deliberate strategies to empower people and to ensure that they have an equitable share in the pie. Now, I do accept that um, in every economy, you normally have pockets within the society in which they may not benefit um, proportionally from the increase in the country's economy. And they will say, hey, look, I'm not benefiting. But generally speaking, the majority of the people uh, will continue to um, benefit. And even those uh, who may not um, benefit proportionally, we will make sure that we continue to sustain the various social programs so that um, we can look after these individuals who may have been displaced or for whatever reason, you know, have not positioned themselves to benefit um, proportionally from the increase in the economic pie. But no one can doubt that the economic pie has been increasing. And again, one of the reasons to why the government continues to invest in certain um, projects and to even pursue our own economic model is to uh, earn profits um, and so to earn profits which will be socialized to the benefit of the people and that is another way in which uh, we can also transfer wealth and to ensure a more equitable um, benefit by, by all. Yeah. Uh, Prime Minister, you started your economic philosophy, your, the ethos of your administration under the phrase uh, entrepreneurial socialism that morphed into economic or morphed empowerment into empowerment capitalism. capitalism. Is it still empowerment capitalism? Empowerment you capitalism. You know, I, I recognize that, um, you know, in the West, um, in Europe and North America, um, I have this bogey about socialism. And, you know, I just felt maybe it was uh, perhaps a little more acceptable to use the term empowerment capitalism. It is really our own pragmatic model of economic development. Uh, when you look at the various um, theories of um, economic um, modeling. They were literally done in large um, countries, large economies where you have uh, many players. So they would have enjoyed near perfect competition compared to small economies in which they, the market is somewhat oligopolistic. And therefore, you have imperfect competition and you'll find that the modeling that they would have done is not quite appropriate uh, for a small island state. And I'll give you a case in point. Uh, when you look at, um, for example, the size of the private sector here and the lack of sophistication to some extent, and when I say lack of sophistication in terms of um, managing large complex businesses, I mean, they have not had that experience. And this is not to you know, use any um, uh, um, pejorative term or terms against um, our private sector, but if we're going to be honest with ourselves, they are small and unsophisticated. In fact, I'll go as far as stating that you do not have more than five local entities that can pursue an investment of, let's say, up to five, 10 million EC dollars. So it tells you how small we are. In fact, Antigua and Barbuda, in essence, is not just a small island state, it's a micro state, of less than 100,000 people. So you would find that um, if the government does not intervene, then what you will have is that the large private investments will be pursued primarily by external entities. And they will come and they will make the large profits. They will repatriate those profits rather than reinvest those profits here. I mean, in the larger societies, um, these companies are quite happy to reinvest their profits in the larger um, countries uh, as they earn them. 
But what you find in these small societies is that they have literally utilized um, these small countries as extractive economies and the profits that are earned are repatriated rather than uh, literally uh, being used to plow back into the economy and to fuel greater or let's say faster growth and development. Now by virtue of the government intervening, it means that we're retaining more profits, uh, profits that we can reinvest and a portion which we can socialize in order to cover socioeconomic development. Uh, so for us that model works better and we do not believe that um, the administration in any small island state should be limited just to regulations. They must be able to intervene or to be involved in entrepreneurship so they can um, intervene in certain large projects, not the small and medium sized projects to be competing with the private sector, but to pursue the various businesses in which um, the private sector ordinarily does not have the monies to participate. I mean, West Indies Oil Company is a case in point. And what will happen too, you will find that as we participate in these companies, we will then divest of our shares and to include the average Antiguans and Barbudans to give them other investment instruments, as we have done in the case of WIAC, in which we have divested so far 10% of the shares, and we will continue to, do, to divest shares and to give Antiguans and Barbudans the opportunity to uh, buy into West Indies our company and to earn sustainable dividends and even to be benefit from capital appreciation. So it's a model that I think is helping to sustain uh, the economy. And truth be told, if you take away the government's um, investments and the few private sector investments that are taking place, the large ones, we could not achieve a 5 or 6% growth. So the model is working. So you're saying, Prime so the government's intervention in the economy, kind of Keynes' approach has helped to increase capital formation of the economy. Absolutely. Mm. But again, it is modeling a way in which it calls for public sector ownership on behalf of the people. And what the people must understand too, when we as a government, we invest in an entity, it is collective ownership of the people to earn profits for distribution, uh, to cover healthcare, education, etc., and at the same time to plow back some of those um, profits into the business. And let me give you another example, or just to elucidate. In the case of West our company, uh, we acquired that firm about uh, six years ago. And so far, we have earned over $100 million from West our company between taxes and dividends. So you'd find that um, a lot of the profits, or a portion of the profits are actually retained by West our company to fuel expansion to the extent that West Indian Company itself has invested over $200 million during that period. When you look at um, the firm when it had an expatriate owner, what they did was to sweat the assets. So at one point, West Indian Company had a, a whole heap of old tanks there that represented um, a serious um, threat to the environment because if we had a, a Category 5 hurricane, I believe we would have had an oil spill. We now have new tanks. The company is better diversified. It's making more profits. It's better run. Uh, and, and it was better run when it was majority owned um, by, the, by, by the government. And we actually took it to the stage where we listed it on the Eastern Caribbean um, Stock Exchange. So you can see that we have provided um, opportunities for management by local Antiguans and Barbudans. In fact, West our company from the time we took it over was managed by local Antiguans and Barbudans. Prior to that, um, Bruce Rappaport um, had some Wall Streeters running it. And the performance of our own people is superior than what pertained before we actually um, acquired a firm. So we have the capacity, and I think where our government is successful is that we have the type of, um, let's say, um, vision and the courage and the boldness to take on these initiatives and to turn them into, into success. And of all of the investments we have made so far, uh, we have been able to um, you know, turn a profit. We have not made a bad decision to date, and we give thanks to the Most High. Uh, and I'll say here too that We've been able to use financial engineering to own assets without taking any money from the Treasury. We're going to come to that, Prime Minister, shortly because uh, you've used the term <laughs> financial engineering in relation to Jolly Beach. We're going to talk about Jolly Beach in a short while in terms of the, the government's acquisition of Jolly Beach. On the matter of for public sector workers, Prime Minister, there's a view that in addition to the salary increase, and I'm pretty sure that public sector workers would be I'm pretty pleased to hear you announce that tonight. So salary increase, back pay, what about a reclassification, though, Prime Minister? Because, in a, you know, for example, let's say people in the public sector are earning a particular level. Correct. They really ought to be earning more Absolutely. based on their qualifications and Absolutely. so on. 
but it has not been a cl reclassification across the sector. Do you think that's important? Because that would put people in a better position in addition to salary increases. That will come. In fact, I believe we promise the teachers in particular that um, the outstanding reclassification will be done. I believe we did a reclassification in 2014 when we first took office. Um, since then, we have not, and um, evidently many of them are qualified now, and that um, reclassification is long overdue, and we'll certainly um, put the systems in place to ensure that um, the reclassification um, is actually completed. Across the public service? Well, you know, I don't know that we can um, get all of them done, let's say, by the end of the year, but I know for sure that there has been a significant amount of work done already with the teachers. And I think that is doable, uh, but obviously we'll systematically address the various areas until we have them resolved. But for me to give a commitment to say that it'll be done right across the board and to get it done within, what, a three-month period, I mean, I, I can't say that definitively. In fact, less than three months of that matter. And remember, to the timeline here is to get these things done before the end of the year, preferably before the end of November. <laughs> before the end of November? Preferably. Preferably. Seems like you're moving on a very fast timeline, <laughs> Prime Minister. Uh, let's talk about the IMF. Would you ever countenance returning to the IMF in a borrowing relationship? You know, I've always been opposed to any IMF relationship. Uh, yes, you do get cheap money, but it also comes with significant implications. I have an antipathy to firing anybody under any circumstances. Even those who ridicule me who work um, within the public sector, I never contemplated um, you know, doing anything for them to lose their work. Uh, when I got into office in 2014, there's not a single person that I fired in the office of the Prime Minister or moved, or even the Ministry of Finance. In fact, the same um, staff that um, the former administration had in place within the Ministry of Finance, I continued to use them. But guess what? They performed better under my leadership. In fact, one of them, um, Mrs. Um, Rosona Davis Crump, she's now earmarked to become our new financial secretary the first female financial secretary in the history of our country. I always give people the opportunity to perform, and I am opposed to doing anything for anybody, even a single person, to lose his or her job. And this is where, philosophically, I have a difference with the IMF, because they look at figures, and they will force you, um, if you're an IMF program, to let go people. And I feel so strongly about this that you know, if we had to go into an IMF program and I'm forced to let go people, I'd rather go home. I prefer to go home than a single public servant to lose his or her job. You do, we'd have seen in Barbados that when they entered the IMF program initially, you had to let go 1,500 people. Uh, they just renewed the IMF program, and another 1,500 people had to go home. I, I, I don't have the type of appetite for anybody in the public service to lose their work. And what will happen to... Uh, if, uh, per, and I, we wish Bobby as well, don't get me wrong, and this is not uh, being said to criticize the decision of the government of Barbados. We respect their position, but if anything was to go wrong and they miss their targets, they don't have to send, send home more people. So it's one thing to get the cheap money, but they, it could be consequential. And what I've found too, remember we were in an IMF program in 2010 to 2014. And whereas the UPP had the $300 million to spend, by the time we came in, we had to start the payments because they had defaulted on the IMF loan. And the IMF had taken a position that we need to go back into another program. And I said to them definitively, under no circumstances, said to them, we will grow ourselves out of the difficulties, no matter how long it takes. And I don't believe that the only pathway to resolve um, fiscal difficulties is to go the easy way to get cheap money because the consequences include damaging the investment climate, and I believe that is one of the reasons, too, why the former finance minister, Harold Lovett, would have said to the nation time and time again when the UPP was in government that he could not attract any investments. Because when you're in an IMF program, it signals to investment investors uh, some level of failure and that you can't manage your affairs and you had to go cap in hand to the IMF to get the money. Uh, so, you know, the way how the market, that is our political opponents, um, going to an IMF program to get maybe 1%, 2% money, uh, they're not talking consequences. And for me, look, I'm here to serve. And I want to make sure that um, we create opportunities for all. And to deprive uh, an Antiguan and Barbian of the opportunity to work, that is where I draw the line. Mm. So on, you, you, you pretty much never will Philosophically want to do that. opposed. Look, I will not go as far as saying never. They always say, never say never. Right. And I'll be mature enough to understand that we could find ourselves in yet another pandemic. And none of us would have expected it after the global crisis. 
that would have had a more impactful pandemic that would have decimated our economies. What if in 2023 that we have another pandemic and then you have absolutely no option? But, you know, I, again, as I said, it is, it would be ex with extreme reluctance and maybe it may even cause me to walk because of my own personal philosophy that I rather leave than to preside over firing or anyone losing their jobs involuntarily as a result of any IMF program. The, the, the pull factor, Prime Minister, for many countries going into IMF agreements, and by the way, Barbados, in addition, has gone into a resilience and sustainability trust. They, they've actually been the first beneficiary of that sustainability, a resilience and sustainability trust, in addition to their uh, bar borrowing arrangements. The pull factor has been, as you mentioned, cheap money, 1% to 2% and so on. Do you think another approach or an alternative would be what you're working on? You're, you're, co, uh, you're the co-chair of a UN panel which is focusing on developing a multi-vulnerability uh, or multi-dimensional vulnerability index, which is to get vulnerable countries, such as this country, high income but vulnerable, access to concessional funding, cheaper money, but understanding the uh, vulnerabilities and the challenges that they face. Is that a better option than to go to the IMF, for example? Well, first of all, I'm not a fan of the RSD, the Re Resilience and Sustainable Trust. Right. Uh, I think that the uh, certain countries um, within CARICOM, they fought for it so that they can get more money. The uh, conditions are such that you have to be an IMF program. I don't see why the IMF would want to uh, create a so-called um, entity or a new trust so that other countries can benefit and still insist that you have to be in a formal IMF program. Because what it does, uh, it precludes a country like Antigua and Barbuda that is philosophically opposed to entering into a formal IMF program. I believe that that program should have had far more flexibility and I feel as though that, um, you know, the, the fight coming out of CARICOM, unfortunately, did not include that component and that the majority of the countries that spoke on that issue, they're more concerned about getting additional monies. Uh, so for me, I'm not a fan of it. I think that um, it is structured badly and that um, the IMF needs to look at that trust again and to make it a little more flexible. Uh, having said that, um, as I said before, there are different pathways to trade out of your difficulties instead of going cap in hand to the IMF. And you know too, when you're in a tight situation, you have to fight your way out of it. You get better value, you get better performance. This lazy approach you just go and get um, IMF, IMF cheap money and just sit down on your laurels. That is what happened now in the UPP. You saw exactly what happened. Year after year, the economy contracted. So there's no evidence that the IMF money that we got in 2010 helped to energize the economy or created any sustainable growth. But you'd have seen that under my administration, by literally fighting our way out of it, by controlling um, expenses and being prudent uh, with our fiscal management and attracting more investments, that we were able to um, systematically reduce our debt to GDP. Uh, and the primary um, uh, balance um, improved. Uh, in, in fact, even um, in 2021, notwithstanding the challenges, we would have seen an improvement in the primary balance and the overall um, current account deficit. Uh, so again, I believe in fighting our way out of difficulties rather than getting the easy money and to sit down on our laurels. Prime Minister, what about the increasing and improving the absorptive capacity of the economy? Because attracting investment, foreign direct investment is great, fantastic for any country, but ensuring that the economy can absorb as much of that foreign direct investment dollar as possible. How satisfied are you that the country is making progress in this regard? Well, the only limiting factor that I'm aware of is the issue of labor. Uh, especially um, for construction. We are now at a situation which um, we do not have enough skilled laborers. Uh, skilled laborers. Uh, we know that, for example, the Dinero project uh, will start within a matter of weeks. They have had the approval for their first luxury home, and the hotel itself will start uh, sometime in the first quarter of next year. Uh, I'm told that within two weeks that the investor that is doing the Marriott Hotel at the airport, they will start construction. In fact, I spoke to the contractor today who confirmed that that is the case, and the invest himself messaged me to that effect. Uh, on Barbuda, you have um, PLH. Uh, just recently, we had another developer that deposited um, in ECAB 30 million US dollars. Uh, that is the first amount of equity, and they'll be putting in additional funds to do another luxury resort on Barbuda. And there's several other projects um, you know, to come and stream. We all know that um, Sunwing has started the renovation expansion of Halcyon. And um, we also um, will see the 
rebuilding of the Jolly Beach um, Hotel. In fact, um, the financial engineering, without getting into any details, uh, we actually sold a portion of Jolly Beach to a private sector entity that will be doing a luxury resort uh, on the Jolly Beach um, land there and will um, create um, you know, significant um, economic um, opportunities for our people. So I'm certainly very pleased and I'll say here the only factor at this point that um, you know, is affecting us is the issue of skilled labor, which I'm pretty sure will be resolved shortly. And by the way, if we have to import individuals from within the OECS, for example, because we have an economic union, we're prepared to do so. And um, you know, I can't tell him overly worried about it. Um, we're better off having a shortage of um, skilled workers than to have uh, significant unemployment within the country. Fair enough. Promise, let's go back to Jolly Beach, or let's go fully now to Jolly Beach. You're saying that uh, mm -hmm. you, ha you, you sold a part of it to the private sector entity. Uh, I mean, is that the Rob Barrett Group? Is that Elite Island Resorts? Yeah, I'm not going to tell you who we sold it to. Okay. Uh, but what I'll say to you, even before we acquired Jolly Beach, uh, we uh, did some financial engineering and sold a portion of it to a private entity. Uh, that private entity, as I said before, will be constructing a luxury resort there. It will be in Nikki Beach with residences, and it will create a significant amount of opportunities to the people of Antigua and Barbuda. What we said to them, though, is that they may have to put back the start of that um, hotel to probably maybe June or so of next year because we have a problem with labor. Uh, so it's not going to start immediately. One thing I can assure you is that the, um, uh, the developer uh, has the resources. Uh, the person is a proven developer. In fact, it's a group of individuals, including um, a well-known um, uh, developer uh, that has a significant amount of resources. So we have no doubt about their capacity. And this is a real project. In fact, so far, they have acquired um, several properties um, within Jolly Beach and Jolly Harbor to build out this Nikki Beach with residences. So it is yet another high-end resort that will be uh, constructed um, on Antigua. So when we talk about next level, the projects are there, the investments are coming in various sectors. We're diversifying the country's economy. We've invested in the port infrastructure to facilitate transshipment, to attract more cruise ships. In fact, we're going to have a record season um, for cruise um, tourism next year, or next season. And um, even um, 2023, for stillover arrivals, we'll have a record-breaking year as well. So our stars are fully aligned. And I'm saying now that um, Antigua and Barbuda is poised now to be taken to the next level. And the last thing we need at this point is any leadership change that could undermine the progress of this country and its people. Coming back to Jolly Beach, Prime Minister. So this is this uh, luxury resort on the property would be separate and apart from the renovation by Elite Island Resorts. Correct. And the renovations that will be done on the remaining two thirds of the property, it is the government ultimately that will fund the renovations, and the property will remain in the ownership of the government and people of Antigua and Barbuda. I would say until maybe another two three years, and we have several entities that are interested. One of them is the Sandals um, Group of Company. Uh, they are seeking to purchase a property to um, construct a beaches hotel. So again, just a lot of activities. And by the way, uh, starting within a matter of um, maybe three months maximum, uh, Sandals will spend over 100 million US dollars to expand its property or properties because they're two hotels in essence and to add an additional 76 rooms. That formal announcement will be made shortly by um, Adam Stewart, my good friend Adam Stewart. And by the way, you know, I enjoy good relations with the Stewart family, yes. contrary to what um, uh, our political opponents um, continue to peddle in the domestic space. So, so Sandals is going to be expanding Sandals that property? Sandals will be renewing and expanding the property and will mm. spend 100 million US dollars. That's breaking news here on our special interview with Prime Minister Brown. Prime Minister, in a, so, so Elite Island Resorts, it's leasing the property. They are leasing. They have a management contract to manage a hotel on behalf of the government and people of Antigua and Barbuda. Oh, on behalf of the... So the, so the renovations are being funded by the government. Absolutely. Say. Interesting. But the, are they overseeing the renovation? I mean, who yes. is really well, carrying look, on? Yes, well, look, we don't have the, the skills to run a hotel. So right. what may happen too, I mean, Rob Barrett even said to us that he's prepared to advance the funds and then we could reimburse him. But ultimately, it will be funded by the government and people of Antigua and Barbuda. And we are now formally bringing the ownership of Jolly Beach 
into the hands of the government and people of Antigua and Barbuda. Now, the issue of severance, uh, we have allocated in the region about 4.7 million US dollars to resolve um, severance and other staff costs. So that issue will be fully resolved. And the reason to why that could be done, and, and this is a little different from the Liat issue, uh, Jolly Beach had a real tangible asset that you know, we could have bought uh, that had value. And as you know, sal salaries and wages, um, uh, th those are priority payments. Uh, so even before we could acquire, we had to pay the salaries and wages. This is unlike Liat, in which Liat has no real tangible assets, only some intangible assets, or the tangible assets that they have are literally um, chattels that are not worth much. Uh, and, and this is where the difference is in terms of um, what is due to the Liat workers. I would accept that Liat does owe the workers, not the government. But Liat has no assets to settle the workers, and that is where the problem lies. So, you know, when my administration um, decided to assist and to give this gratuitous payment of 50%, we we're more than generous because we only owned about, what, 32% of the shares, and we're going above and beyond that 30%, 32%. And I think it's extremely unreasonable for any entity, any employee or any union for that matter, to take the position that we should pay 100%. It's absolutely ridiculous. Jolly Beach workers will get their severance tomorrow, Prime Minister? Well, I can't say tomorrow in the sense that, um, first of all, the transaction should be closed on Friday. Then we're told that one member of the Jolly Beach, the, 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 um, the vendor, was not available to sign. So I believe um, the contract should be executed um, within the next 48 hours. And then some system has to be put in place for the payment um, of the workers. And I don't know how long that process will take, but what I do know is that the funds are now in escrow and uh, we have the proceeds to pay. And within a matter of a short period of time, I can't see taking more than another week, for example, for them to start to uh, make payments to these um, workers. We'll take a short break here on our special interview with Prime Minister Honorable Gaston Brown discussing hot button issues. We've been focusing on the economy. As you remember, for example, that 1992 uh, campaign slogan for Bill Clinton in the US. It is a phrase coined called, it's the economy, stupid. stupid. So that explains why we focused so much on the economy, because everything revolves around the economy. Man is an economic animal. How man organizes to produce the means of his subsistence constitutes the fundamental relations of society. When we come back, we'll turn our attention to some other issues, social issues, governance issues, and of course, we touched on it before. Family election is beckoning. The Election season, the landscape is becoming more febrile. We'll talk about that when we come back with the Prime Minister. Stay with us. Let's get social. We're ready to connect with you. Find us on Facebook. Do you tweet? We do. Send us a tweet. Connect with us on Instagram. Keep up to date with news and more at www.abstvradio.com. Top up on snacks, juices, and household supplies. When you shop at KL Distributors, we promise affordable prices and variety like you've never seen. Have fun with our three for five snack pack. You mix and match popcorn, Cheetos, Doritos, and so much more. We also carry a variety of cereals, granola bars, and healthy snacks. Juices and sodas, we've got it all. Sunny D and Capri Sun for the kids. Ocean Spray, Tropicana, Canada Dry, and Iced Tea. Pick up your favorite household items, supplies such as laundry detergent and fragrance boosters and other cleaning agents. Free island-wide delivery on orders over $60. We're KNL Distributors and Supplies, now located at Number 3 Painters Industrial Park, to Sydney Walling Highway. Sunny Sunday music to chase away your night blues. Neo soul mixed with a whole lot of jazz. Fine art. Join me every Sunday evening from 6 to 10 p.m. And let's paint music in the night air. Press the refresh button for a new week. It's Natalie Clark White. That's me, Nat Nat C. ABS 90.5 FM. The art in soul and all that jazz. Alert! iNet has launched new fiber areas. Potter. 
Herbert's, Gunthrop's, Oliver's, Buckley Line, Renfew, Seaview Farm, Lightfoot, La Pasture, Ferris Farm, Freeman's Village, Clarks Hill, Bellevue Estate, Jonas Road, Mac Pond, Osborne, Mount Joy, Cedar Hill, Parham, Vernon's, Pierce, Seaton's, Glanville's, Willoughby's. It's your time to upgrade to fiber. Visit inetfiber.apua.ag to upgrade or sign up online. Did you miss your area announcement? Inet Fiber is already in the north and northwest parts of Antigua. Check our map for locations. Visit inetfiber.apua.ag to upgrade to fiber today. If you plan to stay at home during a hurricane, there are things you can do to protect yourself. Monitor local radio and or television stations for weather reports. Stay indoors until the impact is over. Stay away from glass windows and exterior doors. Evacuate to a neighbor's home or shelter if your home is damaged or if emergency personnel instruct you to do so. This message is brought to you by the Antigua Barbuda Broadcasting Services. For more information on hurricane preparedness, contact the National Office of Disaster Services at 462-4206. Thank you so much for staying with us in a short while. You'll be able to get your questions into the Prime Minister via Facebook, as well as telephone, as well as WhatsApp. So we'll be giving you all those options and platforms for you to get your questions into the Prime Minister. As I said, no holds barred, fair and balanced. We're touching all the hot button issues. We've been focusing a lot on the economy so far in this our, our interview. We turn our attention now to some other matters, such as social matters, governance issues, uh, and of course, campaign matters. Uh, so Prime Minister, on the matter of uh, social issues, there's a view that there needs to be more done to improve the look, for example, of St. John's, that there needs to be significant renewal. Uh, the city does not bes bespeak, it doesn't typify a country which is on the up and moving towards being an economic powerhouse. What are you going to do towards that? I absolutely accept. Um, that is an issue that um, has occupied the attention of my administration. Uh, in fact, we have agreed to scale up the amount of um, workers at um, CBH and solid waste in order to ensure that we can maintain the look of the, um, of, of, of the city and the country in general because, you know, we're a tourism um, country and unfortunately, you know, the indiscriminate um, littering that is taking place, um, you know, and even a lot of the dilapidated homes and so on, the... Uh, overgrown um, shrubs and bushes and so on and, and, and private property, they make the country look ugly. Uh, so it is one of the areas in which we'll be stepping up and clearly we may have to introduce some regulations um, to penalize individuals who continue to um, uh, litter indiscriminately and also to um, create a situation in which we could um, clean private land and um, charge the individuals or the owners and over a period of time if they don't pay uh, have some form of um, punitive action because what we found is that there are many Antiguans and Barbudans who would have migrated to North America and Europe. Uh, they live in manicured um, communities, but they leave their old dilapidated properties here unkempt and obviously a serious problem in terms of um, health um, with um, rodents, uh, security issue, and just make um, the country look um, ugly. Uh, so uh, it's an area in which we will certainly um, scale up um, the amount of resources that we make available and to beautify the island. In fact, we will also um, be involved in more um, uh, tree planting to beautify the, the country and uh, more cleanup campaigns. Um, I recognize too that um, within solid waste that we have had some delinquency that may have undermined the extent of the, uh, let's say, the commitment of some of the workers. So we'll resolve that issue and hopefully we'll get greater productivity out of them. Uh, so I do accept that is an area that we have to um, address with some urgency. Street lighting, Prime Minister, another concern yes. for uh, mem several communities and, and several roadways, even, for example, the new roadways. I know that the street lighting project has started. Perhaps I've not seen the kind of urgency with it that needs to happen. What do you right. Need to so, on? as you indicated, it has started, and you will see a faster rollout within the upcoming months as we seek to ensure that all communities are properly lit. Okay. In terms of the uh, kind of sewage system, a general uh, centralized sewage system, Prime Minister, that has been mooted some time before. Are you going to work on that right now? That's an next term. Forward? That's an next term project. Um, that's going to be one of the pledges that we'll in, in, uh, in, include in our manifesto uh, for the next term. A new prison? Yes, that too. We don't have the funding in place at this point. You'd recognize that um, we'd gone ahead and um, identified an area um, at the prison farm and um, had brought in some modular units. But based on the urgency to um, um, have better facilities at Her Majesty Prison, um, 
we had to um, use those units there. Uh, but certainly, we still have in the cards um, to build a new prison. I'm not in a position to give a precise timeline in the sense that we have not quite, um, let's say, raised the resources unless we decide to use a portion of the $200 million bond to do it. But that decision has not been taken. But one thing I do know, that is one of the uh, promises that will be made going into the next term in which we will build out a new prison facility. A promise on the matter of school security, would you be minded to asking your, you know, for example, the ABDF, the military, to play a greater role at night, especially at certain schools, in addition and in tandem with the use of technology such as CCTV? I mean, because, for example, there's a view that the soldiers are not necessarily very active, very, um, you know, very occupied at this point, so perhaps they could do that. Absolutely, and it is happening. Um, already they're doing joint patrols um, with the police, and um, we will scale up the uh, equipment and the techn technology that they'll utilize um, for crime fighting. Uh, so we'll be introducing some drones um, shortly um, to assist um, uh, with the crime fighting. Already, you know, we have um, CTV um, cameras around, and um, those will be expanded. And uh, I believe some training took place, and uh, the Minister of um, uh, Telecommunications, um, well, Information Technology, the Honorable Melford Nicholas, would have um, dealt with that issue. Uh, we also intend to, um, uh, you know, have the technology in which you can um, identify um, plate numbers um, for vehicles. And um, we intend to approach um, Calvin Air to have, um, let's say, an accommodation in which um, they can provide services for us to, um, you know, trace um, criminals um, who may be escaping from the police. Uh, you know that the Antigua and Barbuda Defense Force, they were equipped with an aircraft. We intend to add a, at least another one, possibly before the end of the year. And they too will be able to do um, certain circumnavigation um, of the um, shoreline and even those who may be involved in narcotics and so on. And, um, uh, you know, they can literally um, fly over um, and, 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 and trace them and to give them things like um, infrared um, goggles so they can have, have night vision and so on. So we'll be scaling up the technology that will be utilized by law enforcement, obviously, to increase the amount of um, ammunition and weapons as well. And um, I think that over the last eight years, we have made an enormous amount of vehicles to the Royal Antigua and Barbie Police Force. And even though in DCP as well, we'll make sure that we um, get um, additional resources to them. So we'll be scaling up um, you know, the resources for uh, the law enforcement um, agencies. We're even looking at the possibility at some point, maybe um, during the next term, to probably consolidate all law enforcement agencies under a single ministry to facilitate um, greater coordination of effort among these agencies. So again, as I said, we have some very, very exciting plans in this country. And um, it's important that the Antigua and Barbie Labour Party maintains the governance of this country in order to ensure that all these exciting plans that will lift the nation, lift our people, are actually implemented. Prime Minister, on the matter of uh, technology, you mentioned another uh, aircraft to be made available to the ABDF. Would this be another fixed-wing aircraft or are you yes. looking for a, a helicopter? Another fixed-wing um, aircraft. And as I said, insofar as um, helicopters are concerned, I'm told that um, the Calvin Air um, helicopters, they'll be adding a third asset, a third um, helicopter, which means that they can uh, you know, probably make at least one available if we have any emergency to move. In fact, already, they've been assisting us to help, uh, help us to move people from um, Barbuda to Antigua. And um, even the air wing that we now have, they have been moving um, individuals from um, Barbuda to Antigua for medical care. And um, we also will have drones as well, uh, probably drones to even um, deliver, um, to deliver medicines to Barbuda and to use drones as well as part of um, crime fighting. And, you know, in terms of Barbuda, uh, notwithstanding all of the developments that you have seen, we have some more exciting stuff for Barbuda. Uh, you know that we have um, introduced a new energy plant that is um, powered primarily by solar energy. So for about 15 hours a day, Barbuda has been powered by solar energy. And we'll be buying some additional batteries to ensure that Barbuda uh, becomes fully powered by solar energy 24-7. Uh, in addition, you know, we are building out a new airport that can accommodate jet traffic um, in Barbuda that will be completed within a matter of months. Within two weeks, we will start the redevelopment of the river dock into a modern cargo port. And we'll be spending 
15 million dollars in the first instance and that should get up to about 20 25 million dollars to make sure that we have a beautiful facility in Barbuda because already we have designated Barbuda as a port of entry and we'll be able to reduce the cost of goods rather than having them um, come here, the ships come in and go to Barbuda, uh, transship to Barbuda, uh, the ships go directly into Barbuda. Now we intend to make um, Barbuda into a smart city and you know I spoke earlier about the issue of digitalization, the blue economy, green economy, stem cells, um, cannabis, blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Uh, Barbuda presents a great opportunity as an island community to become the perhaps first island community maybe in the world to be fully powered by solar energy and maybe the first smart city. So for example, we will have about um, 300 luxury homes in Barbuda within the next five years. And these are very wealthy people who obviously can afford these unmanned vehicles. And uh, someone who arrives in Barbuda the airport on his private jet, for example, or her private jet could literally um, go on their phone and um, uh, use the technology, get their car to pick them up unmanned and drive back home. These are the exciting things that we have planned for Barbuda already. Unmanned vehicles to come for them? Absolutely. Vehicle. Already. We have um, a project, an artificial reef project, that is taking place in Barbuda. You would have, well, you would have, you would have, um, um, uh, you would have covered it on your news. Yes. Uh, so we have planted these um, artificial reefs uh, just offshore of PLH. And um, for the last year, we have been growing corals because, you know, the corals, we have lost about 50% of the corals right through the Caribbean as a result of um, ocean acidification. One of the, um, uh, you know, challenges of um, climate change. So we found some um, climate resilient ones that we have been replicating and we've been using artificial intelligence to monitor the growth and development of the underwater corals. And, you know, so when we speak about um, new technology and digitalization and so on, uh, they're happening on a smaller scale. And that is the reason to why we established this faculty at Five Islands, the um, Center of Oceanography, uh, so that we can continue to uh, develop the blue economy and to create um, exciting jobs and Antiguas and Barbudas in that sector. Uh, one area that we wish to cover as well is to um, uh, develop the technology so that we can um, measure the carbon sequestration by our seas, our mangroves and so on, seagrass, and to uh, monetize and to even tokenize those um, carbon credits uh, to create a secondary market so that we can um, trade um, carbon credits. And you know too that at Five Islands we have the School of, um, of um, Computing, Science and Artificial Intelligence. Yes. So in as much as we are developing these sectors, we are also training Antiquans and Barbudans so that they will have the necessary skills. And what will happen to within the next um, several decades is that practically all jobs that are created will have some level of computing ICTs. So those who will be trained at Five Islands will have a competitive um, advantage. If, for example, they want to get involved in property management, a person in Barbuda who has a luxury home valued $20, $30 million, they'll be seeking someone with a competence who can manage a property uh, while they're in North America or Europe. They may pay that person probably about $5,000 US a month. And you know, you know, many of them are building smart homes, so they need um, individuals who understand the technology and can help to maintain the technology within their homes. So it is just an exciting space. And when we speak about taking this country to the next level, it is not a cliche. We're doing the work, we're building the capacity, and Antiguans and Barbians can be assured that the Antiguan Barbian Labour Party will take this country to the next level. It's a solemn pledge that we have made. Uh, we take um, the business of empowerment very seriously, and um, we have worked unrelentingly, notwithstanding all the challenges of COVID. We continue to advance the country, and I hope the people of Antigua and Barbuda will continue to exercise that level of trust that they have done, that they have exercised within the last eight years, recognizing that we are at a critical level in our development that requires courageous, bold, competent leadership not to mess around with neophytes, laggards, charlatans, and losers. All right, Prime Minister. Uh, Prime Minister, there, uh, shot across the bow, of course. As you know, uh, the election uh, season is getting more febrile, the political climate getting more febrile with elections uh, with uh, just a few months away. Uh, let's go to the telephone lines first. Uh, Prime Minister, a call coming in. Sure. Uh, uh, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us on, on this edition of our special program, or interview with the Prime Minister. Go ahead, please. Good evening, Mr. Prime Minister. How are you doing? Uh, good evening. We're just uh, going to get your audio on the floor so that the Prime Minister is able to hear you. Uh, go again, please. 
Good evening, Mr. Prime Minister. Good job on the Jolly Beach project, and um, you're doing a very good job. But, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm calling on behalf of Caribbean Airport Services. As you know, Liat, Liat owns 51% shares, and um, two years now, and we haven't heard anything. And we tried to meet with you on several occasions, and you sent us to Mr. Seaford, and when we go to him, he don't tell us nothing. So all, I'm, all I want us to know is what's going on, because it's financial, it's 105 of us, and it's hard on us, because we're not working. So Mr. Prime Minister, if you can address that for us tonight, please. Sure, certainly. Well, I'm not aware that the staff tried to meet with me. Um, I know that um, the management and uh, Mr. Les Brown, who is a director, uh, that, well, they would have met with me at least on a couple of occasions. And um, we're trying to work out a deal in which um, potentially the staff could end up um, as owners of um, CAS. Now, I'm told that CAS owes the government several million dollars. So we are one of the creditors um, who um, is out of pocket. Now, it is important for Antigua's and Barbados to understand that limited liability companies, the liability is limited to the extent of the share of the shareholders. So when you work for a limited liability company, you can go beyond the, the company veil to ask the shareholders to pay you. And that is why maybe we need to strengthen the laws to make sure that maybe they have some form of sinking fund so that in the event the, co the company goes belly up, that they have funds to pay the staff. These are things that we will have to put in place. Now, the government of Antigua and Barbuda has no shares in CAS. And I don't know how anyone could reasonably expect the government of Antigua and Barbuda to take responsibility to pay any outstanding severance or any other liability that CAS may have for any other creditor, be it a staff or any other supplier. That is just inconceivable that anyone would think that when a private limited liability company goes bust or may be experiencing financial difficulties, that it becomes the automatic obligation of the government. Now, we are sensitive to the fact that there are individuals who have been displaced and individuals who are suffering. And as a consequence, we have met with the um, uh, existing um, Chairman, I believe, Les Brown, and at least one other member of the management to discuss how the government could assist them in getting some level of um, ownership and to work in tandem with the other shareholder, not Liat. Liat has no money to see if they can pay a portion of the severance. In fact, in the circumstances, I believe that if the staff of CAS was offered up to a 50% um, settlement, that they should accept it because, you know, 50% is better than nothing. But they have to understand that the two shareholders, one is Liat, Liat has no money. So even if they had money, they, are, they would not have had any legal liability in that case because they're just a, um, an investor in CAS. And the other direct shareholder, uh, their liability would have been limited to the extent of their shares. But in any event, we're still asking them to go beyond the call of duty and to determine whether or not they can raise up to 50% to settle the staff liabilities. But I just wanted to explain the legal aspect. There's a well-known case, Solomon & Solomon, that um, confirms that um, the liability of an investor in a company is limited to the extent of its shares. Fair enough. Uh, by the way, in addition to telephone calls, uh, 4622996, that's the number to call, 4622996. In, in addition, there is the WhatsApp as well available, 7290675, that's our WhatsApp number. Now, let's go back to the telephone lines. We'll come to the WhatsApp and, tele uh, and uh, uh, Facebook in a short while. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Good night. Go ahead, please. Call a girl ahead, please. You're, you're on. Hello, good night. Good night, Mr. Prime Minister. Good night. Go ahead. Good night. Hello. Yes, hello. We're hearing you. Yes, I am. Mr. Prime Minister, um, you're doing a fantastic job for the country. And um, the, 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 Mr. Um, well, the special guys um, here about the way spent his money when they're in power of $2,000. So I want to know why you have anything in place to affect it as um, pretty much we get up to $2,000. Yeah, you're kind of lost. Uh, so, sorry, you said, go get with the question, please. The Prime Minister didn't quite hear. Sorry, you were saying about the pensioners? You hear anything? You hear that? 
No, just repeat the question, please, thanks. You hear what I said? No, no, we didn't, we didn't quite hear. Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, um, I'm just saying that the Prime Minister is doing a fantastic job running the country. And um, the, the, the PLM government will promise while well, especially that they're going to try to um, take this money to a thousand dollars. Just want to know what um, the Prime Minister has in, in place for the pensioners um, to get the money up to a thousand dollars. This is echoing Pensioners. Sorry, what about two thousand? I didn't quite hear about two thousand dollars. I, I hear you said pensioners and two thousand dollars. No, no, a thousand, one thousand dollars. Huh? For pensioners. One thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I know that um, pensioners are agitating for an increase, and that is an issue that we will have to look at and to determine what, if any, amount could be made available. Uh, I do not want to be preemptive here. Uh, that matter has to be looked at. Um, especially in the context of the overall financial condition of the government. Uh, but on the basis that we're in a position to give an increase, we certainly will. But again, I am not in a position to quantify the amount at this time. All right. Uh, Caller, thanks for that. We, apologies, we weren't quite hearing you very clearly. Prime Minister, this is a question uh, for, to the Prime Minister. This is from uh, WhatsApp. Uh, how, is it, how is it the Prime Minister just mentioned that his government gave duty-free because I have a small business and when I apply for duty-free, I can't get any from my business and others are getting and uh, people are getting duty-free and selling the duty-free for $20,000. That's not right. <laughs> no, $2,000 actually. Oh. She said people are getting the duty-free and <laughs> selling it for $2,000. Uh, okay. uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she said that's not yeah. right. Well, well I, I, I'm right. not aware of that. Um, what I can say to you is that um, the process is, whenever these duty-frees um, come to the office of the Prime Minister, uh, no question is asked about their political affiliation, who they are. Uh, they come directly to me, and invariably we will um, sign off the duty freeze. So we are very open and fair about um, granting these um, duty freeze. In fact, they are actually candidates within the UPP uh, who have gotten duty free concessions from us. So we are very liberal. Uh, they, I don't know if the individual, as a business person, had asked for duty free on items to resale. We do not give duty free concessions on items to resale because that will distort the market. If some individuals um, are able to get um, duty free concessions on the items that they sell, then it means that they can sell cheaper than those who have to pay the duty. And remember, too, that we depend on the very duty to cover our obligations. So we use our discretion when it comes to capital items. If it's a car for your business or if it is um, some form of capital equipment, then certainly we will assist. And if it indeed that that particular individual uh, was denied of a duty-free on a vehicle or some capital equip equipment for his or her business, I'll suggest that they call 460-5100, ask for Lynnet, and I will correct it. Okay, there you go. Thank you so much. Let's go back to the telephone lines. Good night. Thank you so much for joining us on our program. Go ahead, please. Hello, good night. Good night, Mr. Prime Minister. Good evening. And good night, Mr. Bruford. Good night. How are you? I'm good. Quickly, you got me to go quickly. Mr. Prime Minister, I just want to find out, why is it taking the government so long to amend the labor code to protect the services of employees? I am aware that, that that has been a discussion point for at least seven years. Why is it taking the government the length of time that it's taken for the government to pass legislation to protect workers' severance because, as we see, it's not working? And it's not fair. All right, yeah, thanks so much. In fact, that's a legacy issue. Um, that's not an issue that existed um, seven years ago. That issue existed um, for decades. And there has been some pushback from the private sector. They believe that on the basis that um, you know, we pass such um, legislation, it will make us uncompetitive. But I do believe that we have to go the extra mile and to put that um, legislative, um, uh, let's say, um, regulation in place in order to protect um, workers and other layer of protection. But again, I believe that the reason why it was not done is because um, the, it was considered to be literally making the um, competitive sector, or let's say the business sector, uncompetitive. Okay. Yeah. Let's go back to the telephone lines. Good night. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Go ahead, please. Hello. Good evening. Good, e good night. How are you? I'm, I'm okay. I'm fine. Good evening to my prime minister. Good evening. To Dr. Brown. Good evening. And to you, Mr. Bethel. Good One night. One quick question. I would like to know um, how soon will be the rebuilding of the Science Institute for the elderly when are we going to rebuild the Science Institute? Yeah. I have to tell you that... Um, the Science Institute. 
our, our audio here is not the best, but I think I got it. Um, we have a donor who had agreed to make a substantial contribution. Uh, we haven't quite gotten the funds as yet. Uh, if within the next, um, let's say, few weeks we don't get it, then we'll use some proceeds from the bond and, to, and commence the rebuilding of the Finance Institute. All right, Carla, thank you so much for joining us for that. Uh, Prime Minister, another question uh, on this. Mr. PM, the country needs cleaning up urgently. Sir, too many break-ins going around because of overgrown bushes and land. Thanks. Urgently. Except we dealt with that before. Again, um, these private owners of land, they ought to take responsibility to manicure um, their properties. Uh, you know, legally, we really have no locusts to go on people's private property and to clean their land. And as I said before, we'll also have to make a legislative amendment in which we can actually um, charge a property and need to even put a lien on the property for outstanding um, fees to manicure and to keep the properties um, you know, properly uh, manicured. Uh, so I accept it is one of my pet peeves. And what I am especially peeved about is that many of these properties are owned by Antiguans living abroad in manicured communities. And they have left their um, properties um, unkempt, many of them derelict and literally undermining our living standards. In fact, I think we will have to make some legislative changes in order to um, deal with that situation. Uh, it may come after elections because you know how irresponsible um, uh, our political opponents are. Uh, if we were to do anything before, I'm quite sure that they will um, use that as political fodder. But it's certainly an issue that we will address definitively in the new term. Okay. All right. I promise that another question on WhatsApp. What can be done in regards to the lending rates for mm -hmm. banks in Antigua, Barbuda? Because it is too high, knowing that what happened during the pandemic. And also, can small loans be offered without down payment, knowing the circumstances, because it is not happening? And if so, too much red tape. So first thing, re uh, the, the lending rates for the banks. Yeah, well, you know, this is really market driven. Uh, so the government um, would not want to legislate. I mean, what we have done with the central bank, and the central bank is actually responsible for monetary policy. Uh, in fact, that's segregated from fiscal policy. What the central bank has done is that it has set a discount rate, and that in itself helped to, and even the, the savings rate helps to determine um, the rates that the bank um, offer to their customers. I do accept that the banks need to be a little more, uh, let's say, um, assertive in their lending. Um, the uh, rate of um, credit that they're granting is not sufficient to support robust growth and development. In fact, in some years, we have seen a contraction in credit when we need to see an expansion. And I would have met with the bankers um, recently and reminded them of their role of intermediation and to facilitate credit and to be responsive and obviously to offer the customers um, good rates of interest and to take a little more risk. I mean, as the individual says here, I mean, if someone, for example, has a good job, has been in a job for a number of years and wants a small credit facility, is credit worthy, why are you going to ask for cash security? I mean, take the risk. And especially with a small loan, ten, twenty thousand dollars. I mean, even if um, it was to go bad, you know, and you have a small portfolio to that effect, it would not necessarily undermine the, um, the operations of the bank. Uh, at the same time, I do accept that our banks have to be responsible. In fact, my government has now put a new monitoring mechanism in place, in which we'll be meeting quarterly with the banks and to make sure that they are meeting all of the prudential guidelines. We don't want to have a situation in which now that um, what 70% of the banking assets are controlled by local banks, that we have any creep of any uh, mismanagement and next thing we have another bank failure. Because these banks are so big now, they're literally too big to fail. Uh, so we're providing a form of um, proactive um, leadership and management by engaging them and to make sure where there are any gaps in the operations that they can address those. One of the issues that I would have raised with them recently is the quality of their service and I've asked them to step up and to seize the type of um, contemptuous service that they're offering to their customers. And they've assured me that that matter will be addressed in due course. Okay, all right, we'll get back to ECAB, Prime Minister, on mm -hmm. a particular matter, uh, in, in relation to a separate matter in terms of the board issue. Uh, good, good night, thank you so much for joining us on uh, our program, our interview with the Prime Minister. Go ahead with your question, please. Good night to the panel. Good night, how are you? Mr. Prime Minister, you have been doing a very good job, you and your team. And I know you have been taking this country to another level, which is very good, sir. But my main concern, if the union already get the union Jews, why do workers from the Jollibee still have to pay a percentage to the union? That's my question to you, sir. And, and my next question is, Jollibee and Halcyon no longer in operation, and you're trying to get Jolly Beach and Halcyon 
back up because of the shortage of room. Why the opposition have a problem if you get in John Beach up and running? Listen, listen up here. Have a good night, sir. All right, thank you so much. Yeah. You know, there are some fees that are included in the final settlement for Jolly Beach. We don't necessarily accept that we're liable, but we did not want to quibble over those fees and to delay the severance payment. So we accepted. But I take the point that the person made that some of the requests that were made by the union, they were really unreasonable. Uh, and we had no such liability. But again, in the interest of peace and to accelerate the settlement, we have just decided to forego um, these um, requests for which we didn't think were liable. Uh, on the issue of the continued irresponsible opposition and rhetoric coming from those who oppose us, I imagine that is really cultural within the UPP. Um, it is institutionalized, and I don't know if we can expect anything different. Okay. Uh, the, I think the caller was also asking about the opposition having a challenge with something about Jolly Beach, with, with the Jolly Beach. And that's what I'm the, saying. It's a form of irresponsible um, uh, opposition, which we have grown accustomed to. It's institutionalized, and we should expect nothing from those who oppose us, especially those in the UPP. Okay. Prime Minister, let's go now to uh, Facebook. There's a Facebook question coming in. So we're, we're mm -hmm. also getting uh, telephone, Facebook, and WhatsApp. So all the platforms, all right? Eau Claire Thomas is asking, Mr. PM, what do you consider to be your biggest success for your governance? I have not stopped to think about it. Um, all I know is that um, I've pledged to work unrelentingly for the people of Antigua and Barbuda. I'm not concerned about legacy. I'm just concerned about performance and delivering for the people of Antigua and Barbuda. And that is really what drives me. So I've not really stopped to think about, um, you know, what's the most significant contribution. Okay, fair enough. I promise. Here's a question on WhatsApp. Uh, good evening, PM. Uh, we're living in. We've been living in Montreal for over 20 years. Your government is the first to attempt to bring water to the community. When can we expect this project to be completed? Yes, it was delayed. Um, I'm told that the trencher um, had to be serviced, and it should be available from next week. And perhaps within the next two weeks, they should be able to complete the job and make water available um, to the residents of uh, Manchula. And as that person indicated, um, we're the first administration that would have taken water to that community. So when I said that we have outperformed previous administrations in all aspects of our development, the evidence is there for all to see. Okay, Prime let's go back to the telephone lines. By the way, for those listeners on radio, of course, we're joined by not only ABS Radio 90.5 FM, but Point FM, as well as ZDK as well. So for those listeners on radio, uh, the telephone lines to call are 462-2996, and uh, as well, the WhatsApp number is 729-0675. Let's go back to the telephone lines. Good night. Thank you so much for joining us on our special interview with the Prime Minister. Go ahead, please. Good night. Good night. I'm calling about the pensioners. For those who would have turned 60, 2019. If you um, would have taken your pension at that time, they said that they will give you at a lesser rate, which in they had sent out a me memo to the various workplaces stating half percent per month. And when you go into the Social Security office, they tell you that they work it out at a formula which is very vast different. So can you please explain that for me? Thank you. I have to tell you, that was so gabble that um, I'm not even sure what the question right. is. Right, in terms of the question. I think they're asking about the, uh, when you turn up a, a pensioner who is 60 years old, uh, at what, uh, in terms of the, how they calculate, I think it's a matter of the calculation of the pension rate when person right, turns right. 60 years so, old. So, you know, um, in 2010, the, um, the Antigua and Barbuda Social Security scheme was deemed to be bankrupt. I emphasize that the Antigua and Barbuda Social Security scheme was bankrupt since 2010. So we had to make some adjustments. In fact, um, the adjustments are recommended since 2010, but the former administration decided to kick the can down the road. Uh, there are several recommendations in which we had to increase the premiums, and we also had to increase the age of retirement. Uh, so you would know incrementally we would have increased the premium by a half of 1%. And also, every two years, the um, age of retirement would have increased until we get to 65. So if you retire uh, before 65, then your pension payment will be prorated, so you'll get a smaller sum. So it will be proportional to what your full pension would have been. If you would have missed out, um, let's say, three years, then clearly you would not be, it'd be reduced by that percentage. Yeah. 
Okay, all right. I think the caller would have uh, gone the question answered. If, you, if you're still not clear, call us back, please. Uh, we had a little bit of a challenge hearing you. Uh, let's go back to the telephone lines. Good night. Thank you so much for joining us on our program. Go ahead, please. Hi, good night. Good night. Yes, good night. I would like to propose a um, question to Mr. Prime Minister, please. Go right sure. ahead, please. Yes. Um, the thing is that, well, I'm, I'm living in an low-income area. And um, the thing that I had, I had written an application to social policy, but it has been for over five years, and um, my house is dilapidated. I do have some funds, but I don't really have the money to share to well and get a house and whatnot. I am really poor, and I really would like some assistance, please. I live in the All Saints area. All right, so we have the I'm Happy program in which we have been um, assisting the poor and the indigent uh, by rebuilding or in some instances um, repairing their homes. I have to admit that the demand for that um, program is so huge that we have not been able to satisfy the full demand. Uh, the other initiative that we have decided to introduce, and that should be operational shortly within a matter of weeks, is the $25,000 loan, which will be stretched over maybe 10 to 15 years at um, a reasonable interest rate, uh, probably no more than about 5 6% to allow individuals to repair their homes. So we will have to have a further discussion um, with the individual to determine what is applicable, um, whether or not this person is indigent, or if maybe low income, and whether or not this $25,000 facility will be, um, will be um, sufficient to assist with the repairs. What I want to suggest that person do is to get in touch with the um, Labour Party representative in that area and we'll be able to provide, um, uh, if she can provide further details, then we can come up with a solution. Okay, all right, uh, caller, thank you so much. Let's go back to the telephone lines. This uh, might very well be your last caller. We have about uh, uh, five or so minutes left in our program. Tonight, time flies, right? We've actually gone almost <laughs> two hours now. Uh, good night, thank you so much for joining us. Go ahead, please. Hello, good night. Um, I have a question for our honorable PM. Go ahead, please. Oh, I want to know, in your opinion, do you believe that the DNA party has put together a better slate, a slate, a better slate of candidates than the UPP party. The answer to that is a resounding yes. I think that um, the intelligence here of the UPP now resides within the DNA, and in terms of the integrity of the candidates um, of the DNA, they have better integrity. Uh, many of them have better competence. Uh, I believe that um, if some of those candidates were candidates um, of the UPP, that perhaps the um, opposition would have um, stood a better chance to dislodge um, the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party. Uh, again, I can speak to some of the members. Bruce Goodwin is certainly, uh, you know, one of the members of the intelligentsia of the UPP, and you have Anthony Stewart, um, Messiah herself. So it is clear that um, the UPP was really depleted of um, individuals of competence, um, individuals um, who had the capacity to govern. And as a consequence, they ended up scraping the bottom of the barrel and have ended up with a lot of um, losers, charlatans, and laggards. All right, uh, Prime Minister there, another shot across the board. Politically, uh, here is an, uh, one last question, Prime Minister, on WhatsApp. Uh, good evening. Please ask Prime Minister, when will the home improvement loan begin? I'm hoping that um, by November 1st that we can launch it. Um, you know, I'll be doing my independent speech. and. In that speech, I would want to launch a number of initiatives to include all of the relief programs on electricity, water. I'll have to go to the cabinet to determine whether or not we include um, internet. Um, property taxes has been decided upon as well uh, to bring a whole package of um, relief, um, considering the escalation in prices that, in prices that um, you know, people have had to endure within the last, the last several months. Okay, so early By independence, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Prime Minister, we thank you so much. We really pleasure. appreciate you joining you. us. Blessings. Uh, it's been, uh, as I said, uh, just under two hours for our program uh, tonight, discussing key issues of the Prime Minister on matters of the economy, social services, the future in terms of the objectives of his administration, especially if he's, he, his administration is returned to office. One of the key stories from this, one of the breaking news items from this is that public sector workers can look forward to an increase and back pay by the end of this year. That's presuming all goes well with the negotiations with the unions. We'll watch that space very closely indeed. And of course, Prime Minister talking about the importance of urban renewal and looking to totally change and transform the look of especially St. John's City. This has been our special edition of our interview. No, no final Minister. word? Yes. 
No final word? Uh, oh, you want a final word? But of Does course. That, in, in 30 seconds. You, you know, I heard you saying that um, if the Labour Party wins, I want to make it abundantly clear. It's an imperative for the Labour Party to be returned to the governance of this country. It is the only way that this country can be lifted to the next level. And I want to say definitively to the people of Antigua and Barbuda not to risk the advancement of this country and to continue to show the confidence and trust in the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party leadership. Okay. Thank you. All right, Prime Minister. Uh, another shot across the world. And you're willing for, uh, you say you're ready for a debate, if, if needs be? If it's worth my if, time. If it's, if it's arranged. And if it's worth my time. Uh, I'll never, um, you know, shy away from a challenge, but I have to make a determination if it's worth my time. Who's going to debate me, Pringle? Really? All right, Prime Minister, on that note, we end our program tonight. Really appreciate you joining us, whether you're joined on television, on radio, at several radio stations, ABS, ZDK, and Point FM, as well as online. A massive audience for the world premiere of our interview with the Prime Minister. We look forward to another interview with the Prime Minister soon, especially as the electoral climate gets even more febrile. Good night.